Okay, well, hello and welcome to chapter 34. And that is chapter 34, uh, evolution of vertebrates. So it's kind of the same thing with the vertebrates versus the inverts. There's a lot of information. So um, I am going to try to make my way through this as quickly as possible, but just know if you ever need to stop and rewind, it's all good. You might find that I am stating really what's on the slide. Um, hopefully I got some good examples to share with you, but being that there are 165 slides to this presentation, uh, we're gonna go ahead and get started. And so as uh, all about the backbones, about a half a billion years of backbones. Um, so basically the early Cambrian period took place about 530 million years ago. There were lots of varieties of invertebrate animals uh, that were on earth during that Cambrian period. And so one of those types of animals gave rise to the vertebrates. And those vertebrates, of course, became very successful group of animals. And so the animals um, called the vertebrates are going to get their name from the fact that they have vertebrae, the bones that make up their backbone. And so uh, lineage of vertebrates that colonized land uh, took place 365 million years ago. That is where you get your amphibians, your reptiles. Uh, and it, notice it says reptiles, including birds, because birds are included in that. And then also your mammals. And so as far as the numbers of species of vertebrates, you got 57,000 different species of vertebrates. And that's going to include your largest organisms that live on the earth. And so I bet you can guess uh, what whale of a organism that could possibly be. And so your vertebrates, uh, basically big, big groups, great disparity, uh, wide range of differences within the group of vertebrates. That's why there's 165 slides to this PowerPoint. And so I'm actually just doing a check to make sure that I am indeed sharing with you. And yes, I am. Okay, I'm going to put this on slideshow now. All right, so when we talk about chordates, uh, chordates are going to comprise the phylum of chordata. Uh, they are bilateral, bilaterian animals. Uh, they belong to the clade of animals known as your deuterostomia, deuterostomia, excuse me. Um, so your chordates are going to comprise all of your vertebrates, and there are two groups of invertebrates that are chordates. And so you have your urochordates and your cephalochordates. And so looking at this awesome clade, um, this, let me go ahead and get my pointer out, my laser pointer. You should be looking at your ancestral deuterostome, your ancestral deuterostome, you can see your echinoderm uh, led off. Uh, I'm sorry, my dogs are, hey, stop it. Sorry, if they're being loud, they're just going to have to do their thing. Um, <laughs> so anyway, your echinoderms, they go off in their own direction. And then all of the other ones are going to be the chordates. And so you can see here, uh, the soonest ancestor, or I'm sorry, the late, the earliest ancestor, uh, was that that produced a notochord. Your cephalochordates are going to be included in that. This little guy here, uh, our representative that we have now, is called a lancelet. You'll actually see this in the next couple of slides, and you can see the common ancestor for all your chordates. This is going to go ahead and lead to urochordata. This is going to be your tunicate. Uh, you'll see later here pretty soon, the tunicate is going to have a notochord at its early development, but not in its adult development. And so uh, leading on to those that have a vertebrae, um, basically going into my, my zinni and the petro my zantida. 
I uh, got a little accent on that one. Um, going into jaws and specifically mineralized skeleton. Okay, so you got over here with the jaws, uh, not into the full mineralization of the skeleton. And those are going to be chondrichthys. And then when you go into full mineralization, actino, uh, excuse me, actinoterogy, uh, this is going to be your fish, uh, your bony fish. And then those fish or those organisms that have lungs or some type of lung derivative, okay? Leading to this direction of lobed fins, these are going to be your lobed finned fish, okay? They're very different than the other fish. Um, these basically are going to be the ones that led to those organisms that ended up colonizing the land. So we'll talk about those here pretty soon. And so um, leading into further groups, we don't really cover dipnoi very much. Um, those with digits, those with digits are going to be your amphibia. You has four legs, so that's where you get tetrapods. Uh, you're like digits, where does reptilia come in there? Well, your reptilia are going to also be tetrapods, and that will include your snakes. Uh, your snakes have remnants of those limbs. They don't currently have the limbs, but they do on their pelvic bones. They actually have those remnants of the limbs. And they are also inclusive of the amniotic egg. So your reptiles, your mammals, amniotic egg versus your amphibians. Your amphibians do not have an amniotic egg. So we'll talk about the differences of that here soon too. And so last but not least, uh, your mammals are going to have mammary glands that produce milk. So these last two, because the amniotic egg, those are called amnioites, okay? And so we're going to find our way through this wonderful vocabulary. All righty, so uh, those characteristics of chordates. All of your chordates have a set characteristics. And so some of them only have the traits at certain points of their development. Like I was telling you, as far as your tunicates, your tunicates only have the notochord during embryonic development. But as long as it has these characteristics during some point, in their development of their life, then you can consider that it a chordate. So your four characteristics of your chordates are going to be your notochord, your dorsal hollow nerve cord, pharyngeal slits or clefts, and your muscular postanal tail. And so as you can see here, we're going to go into the specifics on that. As you can see, your dorsal hollow nerve cord is going to be uh, the most uh, superficial, it's not really superficial, but in comparison with that notochord, um, maybe I'm going ahead and call this most ventral in the case of this organism. And then here's the mouth, and you can see coming from the mouth, you can see your far for pharyngeal or pharyngeal, however you want to say it, slits. Um, this right here, we're looking at mouth to anus. So obviously, vocabulary that we've taken from the past, this is an alimentary canal, the rooter to the tutor. And you can see here, this is the post anal tail. Post anal tail basically is beyond the anus. So your notochord. The notochord is longitudinal, like I showed you, flexible rod between the digestive system and the nerve cord. It is going to be what provides a skeletal support throughout most of the length of the chordates. In the case of vertebrates, it's going to be more complex. It's going to provide a joint. Uh, it's, it's going to provide a jointed skeleton, and the adult retains only remnants of an embryonic no, notochord. So there will be changes from uh, from your fetus to your adult or your juvenile version to the adult. The nerve cord, uh, the dorsal hollow nerve cord. Uh, of the chordate embryo is going to develop from a plate of ectoderm that rolls into a tube dorsal next to the uh, tube that is dorsal to the nerve cord. And so the nerve cord is going to basically be what develops into that central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord. So just think nerve, brain, 
nerve, spinal cord. And the reason when they call it dorsal is when I was pointing out here, I was telling you that uh, it is going to be, um, ooh, I'm so sorry. I said ventral, my apologies. Think about dorsal fin on a shark. Ventral is the other side. So I'm making that correction now. It is going to be dorsal. I don't know why I didn't catch that, silly me. All righty, so next, uh, your pharyngeal slits or the pharyngeal slits, uh, they're going to form on the outer surface of the pharynx. And so in most chordates, those grooves are going to develop into slits that open to the outside of the body. And I'm going to go ahead and give, the, give it away. It's going to open up, in the case of humans, to the inner ear. And so we'll get a chance to talk about all that goodness. All righty, so... Uh, well, unless we'll talk about it now, haha. Uh, the functions of the frangonal slits, uh, suspension feeding structures in invertebrate chordates. Invertebrate means they don't have that vertebrae, but they are still chordates because they follow, they have those four characteristics we just talked about. Uh, the pharyngeal slits are also going to provide gas exchange in vertebrates, okay? except vertebrates that have limbs and tetrapods. So those are going to have gas exchange in different fashions. And so uh, the pharyngeal slits will also develop into parts of the ear, the head and the neck in your tetrapods. And tetrapods, that's us included. Your muscular post-anal tail. Your chordates have a tail that is posterior to the anus. And so uh, that is basically the extension of that tail past the anus. In many species, it's going to be reduced during embryonic development. So we have a postanal tail. Uh, it's very highly reduced, but if you look at our uh, embryos, you will see that there is an extension, that tail is extended. And through something what is called apoptosis or apoptosis, you may have heard, uh, that is basically the, um, it's, it is programmed cell death is what apoptosis is or apoptosis. And what happens is the tissues that make up that post anal tail in your humans is going to be basically degraded. It's going to be quote, eaten away, not really eaten, but um, it is programmed cell death. And that helps to make the reduction of the tail to what we have now. And that is going to be your little tiny tailbone. And so the tail is going to contain skeletal elements and muscles. It provides also a propelling force in many aquatic species. So let's go on to that first little section on the clade. Um, if you recall, when we looked at our original clade, we had our, our sea stars that were on its own little path. And so basically they're considered an out group because they're the thing that does not have, that is, doesn't have anything in common with the rest. And so we are talking about at this point, our chordates. Our chordates first, your cephalochordata, your lancelets are going to be um, the example for cephalochordata that we have now, uh, they are going to be named for their blade-like shape. They are marine suspension feeders that retain their characteristics of the chordate body, even as adults. So here are your lancelets. You can see them here. Um, they're kind of cool looking. They're very tiny. We'll get a chance to see these in lab. And so you can see you have your dorsal hollow nerve cord, your nodal cord, you have your pharyngeal slits and your post-anal tail. So they have all four of those characteristics. Moving on to your tunicates. Your tunicates are uh, phylum urochordata. Uh, they're most closely related to other chordates than are the lancelets, believe it or not. Um, so your tunicates are gonna resemble the chordates during their larval stage. And that is very few, uh, very few minutes. And so metamorphosis is gonna take place as it goes from a larvae to the adult. And uh, that metamorphosis involves the reabsorption of the tail 
and the notochord and a 90% rotation of the organs. So literally during that metamorphosis, the organs are going to uh, change position. And so adult tunicates are going to draw water in an incurrent siphon and they're going to filter. So that's how they eat. Uh, when they're attacked, uh, your tunicates will shoot water through their excurrent siphon. And that's why they, how they get the other name called sea squirts. And so your tunicates are going to be highly derived and have fewer Hox genes than other vertebrates. So here is your awesome tunicate. This is showing your tunicate larvae. Uh, tunicate larvae has the dorsal hollow nerve cord. It's got the notochord, your post anal tail and your frangonal slits. But if you look at the adult tunicate, um, it actually has only retained the pharynx with uh, very numerous slits. And so, yeah. All righty. In early chordate evolution, uh, your ancestral chordates may have actually been very simple and resembled those lancelets. And so the same Hox genes that organized the vertebrate brain, they are gonna be expressed in the lancelets, very simple nerve cord tip. The genes that are being associated, excuse me, that are associated with the heart and the thyroid are gonna be present in tunicates and vertebrates, but absent from non-chordate invertebrates. And so right there, that's where you start to see, um, you start to see that diversity, leaving that unification and seeing that diversity. And so your tunicates are also gonna have embryonic cells that share characteristics found in the vertebrate neural crest. So this, for this reason, that's why they are, they share those four characteristics of what a chordate is and even more characteristics. <clears throat> Excuse me. So your vertebrates are the type of chordates that have a backbone. And so the skeletal system and complex nervous system has, is what have allowed vertebrates to be efficient in number one, capturing food and number two, evading predators. And so vertebrates have two or more sets of Hox genes. Your lancelets and your tunicates only have one. So once again, you are getting that separation and uh, showing that diversity between vertebrates and your non-vertebrate um, and your non-vertebrate chordates. So in the majority of the vertebrates, the vertebrae that are going to enclose that spinal cord, they take over the mechanical roles of the notochord. And so let's go ahead and talk about the neural crest. Give me a moment, I gotta take a drink. So your neural crest are gonna be cells that appear along the edges of the closing of the neural tube of an embryo. And this is yet another unique feature of your vertebrates. And so you can see here, this is, the closing of the neural tube. And then these in green, these are those cells that make that neural crest. You can see here, here's the notochord. notochord. And so uh, the my, uh, migration of the neural crest cells, you got your closing of that neural tube and you can see the cells migrate. So this is something that is very unique uh, uh, excuse me, source, it's very unique to vertebrates. So your hagfishes and your lamphreys. Uh, we have some fossil evidence that shows that your earliest vertebrates did not have jaws. Uh, they had basically simple vertebrae and they were called jawless vertebrates. Uh, we have some lineages today and our representatives are gonna be hagfishes and lamphreys. And so members of those group, they lack a backbone, okay? So they have rudimentary vertebrae and uh, this results in phylogenetic analysis that indicates that hagfishes and lampreys are vertebrates, even though they have rudimentary vertebrae. And so together, 
uh, they form their own clade and that is gonna be called the cyclostomes. Uh, your vertebrate wood jaws are going to make up a larger clade called nathostomes. All right, so let's go into those two. Here's your hagfish right here. Hagfish are going to be jawless vertebrates. They have a cartilaginous skull. They have reduced vertebrae, a flexible rod of cartilage that is derived from the notochord. So it gets very simple. It starts very simple. They have small brain, eyes, ears, nasal opening, and tooth-like formations in their mouth. Um, all your hagfishes are going to be marine, and most of them are going to be bottom-dwelling scavengers. Your hagfishes are going to produce slime, and that's what they do to repel their uh, competitors and their predators. Your lampreys. Your lampreys are going to be jawless vertebrates, uh, marine and freshwater though. Uh, some of the parasites that they feed upon, they will clamp their mouths onto live fish and become, excuse me, they become parasites. Uh, they're free living. They feed as larvae for several years and then they mature and reproduce uh, and die within a few days. And so your lampreys have a notochord and a cartilaginous skeleton. So you can see here, uh, his lovely mouth that clamps down onto their onto live fish. So your early vertebrate evolution, um, your, you can find fossils from the Cambrian explosion that show documented transitions into cranians. And so the most primitive of those fossils are going to be really small, three mil, three centimeter long uh, haikula, um, I don't think I said that right, but I tried. Uh, it resembles lancelets, but has a well-formed brain, eyes, muscular segment, um, did not have an, a skull or ear organs. So it was not like the vertebrates of today. And so look at him, he's so cute. I'd like to have him as a pet. All right, moving on. And I definitely don't want this baby as a pet. Uh, moving on is to the next condonants, uh, conodonts, excuse me, conodonts were the earliest vertebrates, uh, about 500 million years ago. Um, they had barbed hooks as their teeth. Uh, it was great for capturing prey. Um, there, they had other dental elements in their pharynx and there were, they were mineralized. So that's actually uh, kind of special because mineralization took place early and then was lost and then came back. We'll get to that. And so you also have other jawless vertebrates uh, that had muscular pharynx. Okay. They use that for sucking food items. Uh, they also had armor and defense plates of mineralized bone to protect them from predators. All of those jawless armored vertebrates, uh, they eventually became extinct by the end of the Devonian period. And so then uh, your vertebrate skeleton evolved as a structure of unmineralized cartilage. Like I was saying previously, mineralization uh, took place and then went away then your vertebrate skeleton started out as unmineralized cartilage. And so the mineralized bone first appeared on the outer surface of the skull in some jawless vertebrates about 470 million years ago. And the skeletons with a thin, large layer of bone lining the cartilage appeared about 430 million years ago. Today's vertebrates are going to be jawed and uh, they're called nathostomes. They outnumber the jawless vertebrates. I should just say today, the jawed vertebrates are nathostomes and they are basically gonna be uh, the greater in number versus the jawless vertebrates. Your nathostomes include sharks and their relative, ray fin fishes, low fin fishes, amphibians, reptiles, including birds, and your mammals. So let's look at the nathostome. The nathostome is the jaw mouth. Um, they have hinged structures 
with teeth that are used to grip and slice food. And so it's thought that a hypothesis, the jaws evolved via modification of skeletal rods that supported the pharyngeal slits or gills. So other common characteristics of nathostomes are the genome duplication, uh, so that continued duplication of your Hox genes, uh, an enlarged forebrain uh, that is associated with the sense of smell and vision. And so also a lateral line system. A lateral line system is essentially a row of organs that are very sensitive to vibrations. Uh, you are going to find this uh, whenever you see schools of fishes and schools of fishes will just literally just move all together like they are dancing and moving to music. If you've ever seen Finding Nemo, you've seen this happen, but that's because the fish have this lateral line system and it is so very sensitive to vibrations of other individuals within that school of fish. And so that's going to be located in your aquatic nathostomes. Your early nathostomes in the fossil record are gonna appear 440 million years ago. And over the course of time, the dorsal, the ventral and the anal fins, they stiffened by bony structures. And that's how your, what is called uh, fin rays uh, evolved. So your fin rays, they are going to provide thrust and steering control uh, for your fish. This is for going after prey, avoidance of predators, uh, just really just being able to steer through that water. And so your early nathostomes include um, armored vertebrates that were called placoderms. So if you've ever been to the Museum of Natural History in Denver, they have an amazing large guy that, yeah, he's your early nathostome. You should go see him. Uh, you, you would not want to be his lunch. That's all I got to say. So, and, oops, I'm gonna stop for a moment.